Hello and welcome to The Good, The Scars and The Rugby with me, Alma Smith, and we're bringing you the show together with our friends at Allianz. It's the first time we get to hang out with Emily Scarrett again uh, since she returned from France. Uh, she doesn't need the lights on today, which is nice for a change. <laughs> Honestly, it was the weirdest thing. It was honestly the weirdest thing. It's never happened before. Tins, I'd be interested to see if it's ever happened to you. But yeah, what was it? Like 62 minutes, just taking a line out. And then it's, what, about half past 10 at night and all of the lights just go off. It was so, so strange. I think most people back at home were tapping their TV screens thinking something had gone wrong. <laughs> um, and yeah, then the match got called off. And yeah, it was, yeah, it was really bizarre. And such a shame, actually, because that game was... I think a hell of a lot better than the game we played against them the week before. So actually it was shaping up to be a, a good finish, but case okay, are As Hask would say, it probably summed up why you were there. You know, it's like, what's the point in another game? <laughs> so they were like, actually, we've done three quarters. It's been a great game, but eh, I want to go home early. <laughs> it was a really late kickoff though, wasn't it as well? So probably the people that are up top were just like, no, we've had enough now, we're losing and let's just go. Yeah, well, there's lots of theories around why it went off because France were in a lockdown. Um, so apparently everything got shut off at half past 10 or something. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, yeah, why you play a game at 9pm at night when you've been there all day, I have no <laughs> idea, but there we are. And you went there on a sleeper coach, right? Did you then come back on the sleeper coach? Oh. What was that? Like? And how was the sleeper coach? Was it a great coach or was it literally you were still, your knees were up by your chin for the whole sleep? It was sleep? all right. It was all right. The weird bit was we left Crummer whenever Wednesday um, at 10 a.m. So we got on a sleeper bus when we pretty much just woken up. So no one wanted to sleep, but there's like 16 beds in this bus and maybe like room for, I don't know, 10 seats. So it was a bit, it was a bit strange because I think the theory is you obviously travel through the night on the sleeper bus so you can sleep. Um, but yeah, interesting experience nonetheless. Um, <laughs> it was a little bit claustrophobic. I'm a bit claustrophobic and it was a little bit claustrophobic, but um, we got a Nando's on the way down, so it was fine. Who were the players who were like, actually, I've just woken up, but I can, I can do this. <laughs> who was the first one in there and asleep? Lo loads of people, Lo like really surprisingly loads of people. Sarah Hunter was like, oh, yeah, I won't be able to sleep. And then wakes up three hours later. It's like, oh, that was great. Amazing. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think quite a few people took advantage of it, to be fair. But it was a bit rocky for me. Okay, well, um, Mike, I see the barbs are flying ahead of uh, the Lions tour. There's just so uh, much happening on Twitter. Even Rasi Erasmus's daughter got stuck I saw, in. I saw that. I saw that. I saw that. Um, yeah, I mean... It was an interesting article. Obviously, that was in response to Ben Smith's article, wasn't he? That, yeah. that uh, South Africa haven't really proved that they're the world champs. Um, slightly harsh, but I, I sort of understood where he was coming from. But at the same time, it's, sli it's slightly harsh because I don't think they had that much control. He seemed to suggest that South Africa had been ducking and diving. Rather, I thought we were talking about boxers at one point. He's been ducking all the games. I'm not entirely sure that was... That was true, but um, yeah, and then add in the Lions selections and some interesting calls, obviously, in the centres especially. I mean, I mean, there were some interesting things out there, but um, look, I think the dust will settle. Obviously, as Warren Gatman said, everyone f supports their nation first on, on the selection. How did he miss out? How did he miss out? But then I think as the time goes on and as soon as we hit that Japan game, everyone just goes together and then they're all part of the lines and, and, and it cracks on. So, yeah. Okay. Well, let's get on to uh, the business of why we are here today. And that's to hear from our very special guest. Now she, she takes multi-talented as yeah, she just takes it to another level, international cross country athlete. She lectures. Um, and, and so if you study in Edinburgh, you probably uh, might've come across her in a, in a more official environment. And now she's also campaigning. Um, doing some amazing work uh, for women in sport. She's training to compete for Scotland at the Commonwealth Games next year on the track. Welcome to the good, the scares and the rugby, Mari McLennan. Um, apparently, it's been a bit of a headache getting hold of you because your schedule is just crazy. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, it is a bit crazy. I am, um, yeah, T today I started my session at 7 a.m. and I had to get back for a meeting at 9 a.m. and I have been in front of the laptop ever since. <laughs> Gosh, so is this a normal, I mean, where do you fit the training around, I mean, all of the other serious stuff that I just mentioned, because that now almost seems like, how can you be a pro athlete and also do all these other things? So I suppose the, I have a lot of flexibility in that my time is all floating. So all of my commitments are free for me to structure around my life. So it sometimes means that my training isn't like, I don't go out every day at a specific time of day because I can't manage that. So it means that like on some days I'll get out at half past 10 in the morning because I've had to do some work before my training and then I have work after my training and then I have more training in the evening. Um, so it just basically means trying to kind of, it's like playing Jenga with my life, basically. You find that stressful? Because I love a schedule and I, I'm a bit of a nose for a consistent schedule as well. So I think that would really stress me out. Um, sometimes it's stressful, obviously, don't get me wrong. Um, and you know, it means that sometimes you're rescheduling meetings and moving things around. I love the variety. I don't think it's sustainable. I am definitely looking for a way to make it more regular. <laughs> so does training always take first place and then the rest is built around it or how does that work? Yeah, mostly training would take first place. So like making sure that I know when I'm getting my training in is my priority. I'd be really but, jealous of you if you said, no, actually, I could, the training's easy, the easy pit. And I'm like, well, hang on, looking at everything you've achieved and you don't even put training first. I was like, please, please tell me she puts training first. Yeah, no, I definitely put training first in a way. I suppose that like there'll be things that are more important in that day. Like, so for example, yesterday, if it's an easy day and I just have two easy runs, I'm not going to prioritize them over and above an important meeting but i will make sure that they're done it just might not be that like they're the kind of main focus of my day whereas today i was like no the whole of yesterday is structured because i have an important tomorrow like session tomorrow morning before the day so i need to make sure like the session's the highlight and then i'll just get through the rest of the day Wow. So how much running do you, or uh, training, I mean, how much of your training is, is it just, do you just go on these, you know, crazy long runs? Do you break them up? How does that actually work on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, kind of depends on the week. So this week I raced on Saturday. So um, I had to kind of rejig things. I would normally have like a hard session twice a week with a kind of like medium to hard session on the, the other day. So I would normally train hard Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Um, but this week it's Wednesday, Saturday. So, you know, that's a bit like, oh, okay, rejigging, it's fine. But yeah, essentially, I, I mean, I have two gym sessions a week. So that means that I train twice a day on some days. Um, I actually find that easier because I don't often have like a huge block of time free in a day. So if I have like, sometimes my coach will say, oh, okay, can you do a long run on a Wednesday, which is a 90 minute run or more? And I'm like, no, I don't have time for that. No, I'm going to have to split it and make it 245s at the other end of my day. So I kind of bookmark my day with training, essentially. Can you quantify a hard session? Because I'm really interested. Obviously, we do some just running sessions. And if I'm honest, I it's not my bag. I much prefer to have a rubber ball in my hand. But what is like a hard session? Because sometimes when we're doing like mass or tempo runs, we're running what, what we think is fast and actually for proper athletes, you would have lapped us six times by that point. So this morning, um, I did a session on my own, which was a continuous run. I find this really hard, but it's because my legs are really tired. This is normally the kind of session I would love. But basically it was five repetitions of one mile at six minute mile pace. Um, and then 600 meters at five minute mile pace. And like then not stopping. So just like, fluctuating between those two speeds continuously until you're done wow yeah and for anyone who's listening who I'd is a blog yeah who, who is this, a, a very slow um you know shuffler like me five thousand meters so you basically do a 5k in 15 minutes when you're competing yeah which uh, to me sounds like it should be impossible <laughs> um i mean I hear the numbers and almost in my mind, I'm going, that, that can't be, that sounds inaccurate. Um, but you're obviously not doing that the whole time. 
oh gosh no 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 like I rarely ra would train at race pace like I had a race specific session the like week before the race I did on Saturday and like I was nervous about having to run at race pace for a session like because you know if you go to that session and you don't hit race pace you're like well I'm gonna do it in the race if I can't do it right. now um but you and you would also never like just run a 5k at race pace during the week because when it comes to race like yeah. you paper you rest you prepare for the competition so there's little, so mm. many variables that kind of like put you in a position to be able to run faster than you ever would in training then what's the recovery process like after if you go full race pace and in a race how much does that take out of you because obviously during competitions you you've got to maybe have to do that three times over a, a certain time period a week or 10 days or whatever it be yeah so what, it, what is the recovery like well it depends on the race and it depends how like i suppose kind of far into the season you are because you'll get better at recovering because your muscles are getting more used to um kind of the actual race environment so like i did the, my first track race in about i think it was 21 months um on saturday and i am very sore because i haven't been using spikes in training so spikes are like have no support at all like it's quite they're quite hard on your legs um and I, cause I don't train in them. Those muscles are obviously like, whoa, what did you do to me? <laughs> um, whereas I would hope that kind of further down the season, it won't take as long to recover. Um, so that's kind of why we rejig this week so that my, the harder session is going to come later. Um, but yeah, recovery, it's just like making sure you're eating enough. Like at the moment I'm, because I'm in London, I can't get a massage. So I'm just self massaging or, you know, pulling in favors from boyfriends. <laughs> um, I say boyfriends. I'm yeah, I was going to say. I have, I have just one. <laughs> <laughs> I said he's he's now going, uh, sorry, what? Uh, <laughs> no, how many of us are there? <laughs> um, yeah, and then, and, you know, it's just kind of like making sure that you're yeah fueling correctly and taking on loads of like water and hydration and sleeping loads after the race, which I actually find really difficult. I cannot sleep after an evening race. You were saying your rugby game was really late. Uh, that's crazy. I had the same. I had my race was at like 9 p.m. on Saturday, and I just yeah, I didn't sleep. <laughs> Woke up at 4 a.m. Like so, <laughs> run anyone? <laughs> it's just so hard to switch off, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, luckily for us, our last game was our last game, so we stayed up and had a bit of social time together, which meant that we didn't try and go straight to sleep. But normally, it's yeah, it's just so hard to switch off. You want to? For me, I want to watch the game. I want to try and figure out the good, the bad compartmentalize it somehow and all of that means that you just you just don't sleep and I, I guess the thing about being in a team is that you can kind of decompress together whereas when you're I mean do you hang out with the people you ran against after the race uh no <laughs> um yeah running doesn't weird. got time yeah well yeah no, no, no. um running's weird yeah we definitely don't hang out I maybe sometimes like if you're away at a competition and it's a team event so like I don't know world cross countries or like you're a European event and like for cross country it is a team um yeah then obviously you would talk about the race but you're still talking about your individual performances really um so it's not like yes you can gain a medal at a competition as a team but it's based on how you all did individually like so it's very even when it's a team-based thing it's still very individual so what is it that 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 gets you up um, when you are really sore and really tired and you have a to-do list longer than most, um, you know, family families put together as a solo individual <laughs> uh, that gets you out there come rain or shine or workload? Um, I think having really clear goals for a season or like long-term goals as well. So I've worked with my sports psychologist to make sure that I have long-term goals like medium-term goals and then short-term goals as well so like I'm still I had quite a long time out of consistent training due to like health reasons and personal reasons and I am still kind of getting a buzz off of being able to build consistent week after week training um so like when I look at my kind of average over the last year and I can see that like it's gone up two miles for the whole year average I'm like oh my goodness this is amazing but then at the same time you know I'm trying to train to qualify for the Commonwealth Games so that's like a huge wider goal that 
terrifies me but I know that I need to get out the door and it's that consistency like building bricks and making sure that week on week day on day you are training consistently you know it's not about having kind of like PB performances and you know breaking your own personal records every time you go out for a session it's just consistency I was gonna say if we go back did what why running why where was the love of running come from um, I think I've told the story. I, I, I think I could speak for Emily. Most rugby players hate running, even and we we only do it because we have to to play rugby, but we wouldn't do it off the field. So, how did you fall in love with running? Yeah, um, I think well, I mean, when I was in primary school, my family were really really sporty, but for kind of other sports. So, like we did a lot of hill climbing, we did a lot of canoeing, cycling mountain biking and um the school janitor was putting on some cross-country sessions at lunchtime and honestly I just thought it looked really boring and like very plain mm -hmm. I was like god how dull running around a grass field like there's nothing there's nothing life-threatening about that um and one of the girls in my primary school I think she was like oh you think you're so sporty but you're not really because you don't do cross-country so I'm just really competitive naturally so I think I loved when I first came down to do one of the like Tuesday lunchtime sessions, I just loved how like pure it was. Like I didn't realize looking at it that it's literally just you putting all of your energy out there in a very kind of transparent way. Like, there's no like, and that's why it's quite simple. You know, it's not like rugby. It's not like other sport team sports where there's tactics and skill. It's, just I mean there are when it's track races and it's shorter distances but with cross country which was my first kind of passion and love it's just exertion and exertion to the point where you are completely depleted and have done the best of your own ability and um, I also like that you could beat boys at that age that was hugely like it was, that was a massive kind of motivator for me I took it very hard when that stopped happening <laughs> what age was that I think uh, it would have been quite late by the sounds of your, your mental strength. I think it will be quite later on. Yeah, I was probably about 10 when I started, like, running in primary school. And then, um, yeah, kind of, I just continued it forever, really. It was like, <laughs> it was like a kind of another family, another community. Um, and just, yeah, I loved the people that I met through it. Um, that was definitely what kind of drew me to it. Um, all suffering together in, like, all weathers. It brings people... Very well, strange people together. Uh, I was going to say, you would have had some severe weather up in... You were in Vanessa, weren't you? Up that way. Yeah. Close to where my wife went to school. She was up at Gordonston, so she wasn't far away from Inverness, in Elgin or wherever it was. Yeah, she said there was quite interesting weather up there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I remember as a kid wearing, like, tights and then leggings to go out and, like, run in knee-deep snow and run around these pitches. And sometimes you'd stop and be, like, have these outer body experiences where you're kind of thinking, why am I doing this? This is so silly. There, This is so silly. There's no point to it. I don't understand why I'm running circles around a grass field. Don't get it. Do you, and, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Do you just, you're so good at it comparatively, you know, in terms of your age group, that as soon as you start winning and start, you know, kind of really performing, this is the thing that you then start f almost finding your excellence and a bit of your identity in? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think I've definitely battled a little bit with that throughout my time in the sport, that, like, I love running and it's really consuming as and it can, it can completely take over your identity. So now I think I've gotten to a place where I have a much better balance and I can appreciate that it's part of who I am and it's a big part of who I am, but it's not everything that I am. And that's also really important to me because I have, as we've discussed, a lot of balls juggling, but those balls are really important to me because I don't ever want it to be so consuming. But yeah, like learning that as a kid, I think it's good to have this external kind of source of motivation and competitiveness that's quite natural and quite um yeah it, it, it's it's just it's very innocent I suppose in a way um particularly at that age and then when when was it that you I mean you, you're excellent at running you're performing um you know you really seem to have everything cut out for you at what point did you reach that realization that um you are a runner but it's really just kind of a part of who you are um 
Probably in 2019. Um, I know that seems like it actually took me a really long time to figure it out. Um, but I, yeah, I was definitely, I, I've always kind of excelled academically and that's also been something that I've put my energy into, but I always saw it as kind of a necessity and running always came first. So I didn't care if I had an exam, like I was going to the race. Um, and I couldn't understand people that didn't do that. I just, I, I, and I looked at other people who didn't run and didn't do a sport. And I was just like, yeah, but what do you do with your life? Like, but why? But I don't understand. And I think now, um, I, in 2019, I, I really questioned whether or not I was going to continue with the sport. And I, and I felt like the sacrifices you had to make to be um, at the level that I was trying to get to were more than I was willing to, to, to kind of give up. And I, I think, I think because it had been so consuming for me already and more than it needed to be because of kind of other external things that were going on for me, I was channeling everything into running. And I think I thought, God, I don't know how to give more of myself to this in order to achieve more. I, I can't do that. Um, and so I really wanted to take a step back. Um, and I did, I was able to, I suppose in a weird way, thanks to the pandemic, um, it really gave me that space to breathe and to recal recalibrate and take stock of everything in my life and honestly hit pause because I felt like I was a little bit in a kind of hamster wheel, just like exhausted, but trying to keep going. Um, and I was struggling with a lot of illnesses as well. And um, yeah, I think now, I've kind of come out the other side and have really had a lot of appreciation and understand that there is more to life. And like, I'm looking forward to at some point not being a runner. Like that is something that I do look forward to, but at the moment I'm still very much there and enjoy that too. Do you relate, Emily? Has there ever been a point where, where you were like, oh wait, I'm not only Emily, <laughs> I'm not only scares the rugby player. Yeah, definitely. I think, like I always think back to when you go to like family events and stuff or you meet new people and they're like, oh, how's rugby? And once you've covered that, sometimes people don't have much more to say to you. And I've always found that, um, not, not family, family was probably a bit harsh, but you know, people are a bit further away from you because um, they don't really appreciate that you are a person. You do have other stuff going on, albeit often not, um, not as much, but... Um, yeah, I can definitely relate. And I think I can definitely relate to, to what you're saying about actually COVID and thinking back to this time last year, we obviously, our season got cancelled. We had a big break. Um, I think lots of us looking back on it were tired. It was, it's been a long, I, I don't know how long I've been playing and I, I've never had a proper break other than forced through injuries, but actually sometimes you work harder when, when you're injured than when you're fit. Um, so actually having that time to just completely, completely switch off. You weren't having to watch rugby because there was none on. You weren't having to train properly. I spent a lot of time back with my family at the farm, just doing random things. I think we spoke a bit about lands landscaping my grand's garden and things like that. Like, it's just really refreshing. And that was forced, but I think it's actually made me realize that you need that time away as well. You need that time to, to step away from something that is so all consuming. And look, I love it. I, I probably don't want to do that because I do love it, but it, I think it's actually really important and actually is, is a necessity at times. So actually it's figuring out how you fit that into a season or a year or a, you know, pretty big competitions and stuff is, is probably something I definitely learned in the last year. Um, Mike, that probably helps when you retire, if you've managed to, if not maintain, then gain some perspective on who you are out of the sport before you finish. Yeah, but it, it is difficult. I, I think um, what mari has been saying there is is very unique in terms of how much how many interests she's got on whilst being able to compete. I mean, I think I I would say that my sort of generation, because I'm slight, slightly older than you all, um, uh, was were basically guinea pigs. We were tr we were in the club all day so it was very hard for you to do external things without then thinking about putting your training at risk you know you look at sort of when when I sort of finished we were in I was in at seven and left at four and and then by that point I I my brain had 
had enough of then what was mm. going what I could be doing out externally and you had to use those for days off and um yeah I think rugby is just one of those games because it's got so many facets to it you know whether it be if you're a forward you're going to have your line out sessions you're going to have your scrum sessions then you've got all your rucking and mauling and and then backs moves and well backs moves and basically drinking coffee if you're back it's slightly mm. easier probably if you're back as Emily will, will will tell you um but yeah I it, it, I think for rugby, rugby, it was a bit weird when I retired because I didn't really have that extent. I'd, I'd put so much effort not to do other stuff and get distracted from what rugby had been for me that then possibly when you leave, you have that, and everyone uses the word imposter syndrome type thing, is you don't really know where you fit into the world and what, what that's going to be. And um, yeah, then it takes a bit of time. So I'm very, very envious of how amazing Mari sounds and the fact she can do all these things and teach and. Uh, it's uh, credit to you. Well, well done. But I mean, Mari, it hasn't always. I mean, it's it's it sounds amazing. But uh, in listening to other interviews you've done and reading up, up, you were very ill there for a while, and it does seem like, if not your body, then your holistic existence was untenable for a while. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So I. Oh, it's a bit of a long story, but I guess the highlights, uh, if we can call them that, uh, are I left an abusive coaching relationship and then broke off an engagement, which was also abusive. And then I kind of fell apart. Um, I did go to, I kind of managed to keep it all together, went to World Cross Country Championships, had the race of my life, absolute career highlight, and then kind of later that summer I became really disconnected and kind of jaded with running I was exhausted with I think I kind of because I had to had to start my whole life over again I was trying to build a new social life and trying to kind of I suppose find myself again as cliche as that sounds and balancing that with the commitment of running it was just too consuming and so I took a long season's break um, I took about a month off, which was really uncommon for me. It was hard for people to get me to take a break from running in the past. And in that break, I got really ill with a chest infection that essentially just didn't go away. Um, I was ill continuously for about nine months. Um, I just had, I think it was the same chest infection um, that just kept resurging. But when I say chest infection, to put it in context, when people have described their COVID symptoms, it sounds really similar to what I had just on on repeat for nine months um, and I was in and out of hospital for tests I was on and off antibiotics um, and still trying to train sort of at times when I could um, and then I think it got kind of the pandemic started and at that point I was like oh my goodness there's a respiratory like viral infection that's infecting the entire world and I can't breathe <laughs> like I need to go home to the highlands so I went up to my parents and obviously was like laid off from work from the university early and um was my my other job that I had at the time was kind of on hold but looking to be moved online and it just I honestly was almost kind of like unemployed but again kind of as you said Emily like I was kind of in a farm type environment my dad lives in the countryside so I was spending the days like digging his garden and planting potatoes and digging out the drive and um I think it just allowed me to really pause reset and I started back training once I was well but when I say training I mean I was going out for walks and my asthmatic brother who does not run was beating me in runs like I couldn't keep up with him um and it was for 20 minutes or less than that maybe 15 sometimes um so yeah it just took a really 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 long time to come back and I suppose I've been building that since May last year to now so it's taken like a full year to kind of get back to where I was at the start of 2019 fitness wise um but when I compare mentally how I am now it's completely incomparable like I'm actually happy about being here and happy about competing um, and motivated to go further whereas I think at the time I felt like I couldn't go any further. Were there, were there any 
sort of when you say you're going out for runs and you were struggling in 15 minutes, were there any doubts then and in terms of, oh, well, I can just go back and do my job and I can hang up the sp- hang up the spikes, or well, you don't use spikes by those things very often, but hang up the trainers and uh, and just move on with your life? Or was there an instant, no, it's this will be good for me to, to work my way back and I want um, to do that? I think at that point, I honestly wasn't thinking about ever coming back to compete competitively. I was genuinely just, I love running. So I was trying to kind of rediscover my love for it. Um, And being back where it all started actually really helped because I was just kind of rediscovering all of the routes I used to run on as a kid and remembering why I loved it and like not running with music. Because I think I'd kind of gotten to a point before that I needed, I train a lot on my own. My coach lives in the North of England and I don't have a training group in Edinburgh. I have a couple of guys now who jump in, but at the time I was doing everything alone. So I needed music to get me out the door. Like I absolutely could not leave the house without noise. Like I couldn't even be alone with my own thoughts. And I think then at the start of the pandemic, I was like like allowing myself to just try it without music and then actually really enjoyed it and enjoyed the liberation and the freedom and kind of, yeah, brought me back to all of the reasons why I started it in the first place. Where are you at now with that? Do you, do you still use the music? And if so, what's what's your running music? I'm really interested because I really struggle to run, as we've said, so I could do some inspiration for some running music. Um, it honestly depends on the day. Like I will use music um, to get me at the door still sometimes. Obviously, like my life is very busy and actually sometimes it depends how busy the week is. Like I really enjoy listening to music. It's a big part of my life, but I don't actually have time during the day. So if I'm going out for a run, I'm like, oh, amazing. I'll listen to this song I wanted to, or I'll listen to this kind of music because I haven't been able to in the day. Um, but it's not like I need this to get out the door anymore. Um, and honestly, I listen to kind of anything. I, I kind of like listen to guilty pleasures when I'm running. So like, like, I would say like cheap pop so like oh, good cheesy stuff yeah and like also even just like kind of women power type those like little mix and those kind of bands that you don't want to say that you like but <laughs> when you're running, it's good. um so yeah literally I think my playlist is called cheap thrills so um oh. yeah I mean follow me on Spotify <laughs> <laughs> kidding don't hey. embarrass it <laughs> Um, but yeah, I just, and I, and I think, yeah, sometimes I'll, I really enjoy like running with friends. So like tomorrow afternoon, I'm meeting up with a friend for a run and it's also like part of my social life, I guess. Um, got to fit everything in. You mentioned kind of in passing, um, for anyone who wasn't paying attention there, that you were abused by your former coach, which is, I mean, that is such a dark place to even imagine because of how important particularly when you're an individual athlete, how important that relationship is and how much power dynamic kind of comes with that. Um, And the fact that you came back and started running again, when I, when I read about this, I went, you know what, if my coach was found guilty of sexual misconduct, that would be me. I'd be like, cool. Thanks. I don't need the sport in my life because clearly this is not a good place for me. And you didn't only come back. You've not only fought your way back to some crazy times that you've been posting recently, but you've also come back and now you're doing, I, I would I would say, you know, some of the most important work you've ever done outside of the running. Yeah. Um, creating this campaign um, and really changing the sport for the better. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you've touched on that. And um, so I was with that coach for six years and I um, really struggled. So what what ages was that from until? Um, from 18 to 24. Um, oh. And I really struggled to like accept. I think it's really difficult, kind of what you just said. So that relationship is so important and it's really difficult to detangle what's happening and also how you feel because I think as an individual athlete like you take your hopes and your dreams and you place them in that person and you trust them to execute you know your training and that relationship in order for you to succeed and as a determined and motivated young woman like I was I was probably pretty willing to turn a blind eye or ignore things that were happening in order to have 
someone telling me that I was doing a good job and that I was you know I, I was worthwhile I was I was worth spending time on because I was going to make it or I was going to succeed um and it took a really long time for me to feel like I could come forward and speak about it um especially because I didn't actually understand kind of how much of it was abusive you know there were specific like events that I could pinpoint and say well I know that's wrong and I know that that's not okay but not all of it to me what it was like kind of black and white and you know I didn't actually even realize that until I had come forward and had spoken to people about it but I think yeah I so I came forward last year and they launched an investigation and suspended his license and then he was issued a five-year ban and for me that was really bittersweet because on the one hand I was glad that action had been taken and that you know there had been no appeal and that I'd been listened to and believed because that's obviously the, the main fear for any victim coming forwards. But then on the other hand, I really struggled to get to grips with the five year time period. And I couldn't understand like, okay, so after five years, what happens? Like he comes back and is put in the position of trust again with more young women, like how is that okay? And so that was when I collaborated with two friends um, who we didn't really know each other I suppose I always refer to like running friends as almost like colleagues. So I, I, I knew them through work, you know, the, my other work. And we launched a campaign whereby we kind of wrote an open letter petition to the CEO of UK Athletics asking for a zero tolerance um, policy implementing life bans for abusive coaches. Um, and then we launched an Instagram campaign off of the back of that to kind of increase the virality of what we were doing and we managed to get 2000 signatures and the policy got changed and because it then you know that was so motivating and that was for me completely has entirely changed the direction of my life and and inspired me the fact that people would listen to me and believe me and um you know g give my voice time you know, like airtime um, was so empowering that I wanted everybody to be able to be listened to. And I thought, well, this is a really good opportunity to capitalize on this movement and capitalize on this kind of wave of change and push it further. And so one of the girls and I, um, Kate Siri, have decided to launch a nonprofit organization called Kaniska Advocacy to continue to campaign for policy changes in women's sport so we're not staying within athletics and we're not staying within abuse but we want to basically make the world the sporting world a better place for women and implement policies and amend policies to better protect respect and celebrate women's sport um so yeah that's kind of what i've been up to <laughs> wow i just think i think it's ridiculous that it's a five-year ban got handed it just just seems wrong on so many levels um, you, you should only get one chance if something like that goes on, you're out and you're never coming back. Take that away. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. How does it even look in five years' time? Uh, well, who is going to hire him, first and foremost? But, um, yeah, I think that's just ludicrous, really. I just have so much respect for the fact that you came forward because I have had so many conversations with women who have been on the receiving end of sexual harassment and you know the full as you say the full scope of it sometimes you think this is a bit off science but i mean and then there are incidents where you go okay whoa whoa whoa, whoa, whoa. this is this is really not like ever excusable in any context but i've not often come across women who are brave enough while they are still competing or in the position or in the job or in the industry that they find themselves in to then speak up yeah many people wait until they say i'll i'll do something about this when when i'm when i'm not working in the space anymore yeah and i think i mean there was i guess i did do that to an extent in that when i initially left my mom was like you need to come forward you need to come forward and i just knew that I'd already created such turmoil in my life <laughs> that I, I was like, I can't take on anymore. I can't do that right now. I'm not ready. Um, and it wasn't until actually a younger girl who was also coached by him 
contacted me and said hey like I want to report a coach you probably know who and I was told you would know how and I remember just thinking this is so embarrassing because I don't know how and if someone younger than me can have the the bravery and the confidence to come forwards I need to be a leader in this like I also you know I need to step up and so instead of telling her oh do I actually know how to do this um I just went and found out and then we kind of did it together I suppose and there were three of us who came forward at the same time and um yeah I mean I I think at that time I honestly felt like I wasn't really a runner like I didn't really feel like I was a runner anymore in that I was running for enjoyment but I wasn't I didn't feel like I was training towards anything um so yes and no but yeah does so does it motivate you is, is that part of the motivation when you compete now not just as a sort of F you to, to the coach of the past, but also uh, then as a platform, you know, working towards the Commonwealth Games in terms of if you can still stand at the top of that podium and you can, you're you there championing the sport that you've returned back to, you've fallen out of love with it, you've gone back to it, but also it then puts you on a platform to let other women out there know that it can happen, but you can come back and, and you can do the full circle and, yeah like absolutely I mean I think it's it's less like I don't care about him or or his reaction or how he is I I I just wanted him to not be coaching anymore um and I suppose um yeah my performances are my my motivation a huge part of it does come from wanting to prove to myself that I can come back and do it and also show other people that it is possible as well you know show other women um and, you know, kind of competing in that new relationship that I have with running and I feel like I'm building with it. I want every single person who's listening to this to go find the Kaniska Instagram because there are some fierce messages on there. And I love the amount of work that you're doing that, as you say, transcends abuse and it transcends athletics I mean you guys are athletes um but this is about a lot more than that and you are creating such a powerful platform tell us about why you called it that um yeah so we called it Kaniska because Kaniska was the name of the princess of Sparta uh who was the first woman to compete in the Olympics in ancient Greece in 396 and 392 BC Uh, And she won the gold medal in the four horse chariot race and then subsequently uh, erected a statue of herself to show everybody what she'd done and inscribed a poem on it, essentially saying that she was great and had won, Um, (laughs) which we just thought was amazing. And we kind of wanted to use her name and and in honour of her and show, you know, women can stand up for themselves and we will and we will make our mark. Just badass, isn't it? Yeah. She was like, right, this is what I'm doing. This is what I've done. There it is. And I'm, I'm amazing. Look at me. Celebrate she, that fact. Yeah. yeah. And she had the way whistle to put it up in, in a, on a kind of, um, in a way that would survive her. You know, that, that awareness of legacy and of leaving a sort of mark that would outlive your own, you know, um, span on this earth yeah. is, I mean, that's quite powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I've been asked a couple of times, you know, what is your ultimate end goal with Kaniska? And I mean, and and this is not unique. I I know other women's trusts and charities that have the same um, end goal, but it's to be obsolete, obviously, you know, to be in a position where women and men's sport exist in an equitable environment where each the women's game and the men's game is respected in its own right. And you know, that it's a safe place for women and athletes to compete in. Like, that's obviously what we want. Um, but yeah, it might not, t- that might not happen in our journey with Kaniska. It might happen in like the next generation of Kaniska women. So one of the practical things you're working on at the moment, for example, is the maternity clause, right? Yeah, so we're, we've been in conversation with... Um, a cricketer um, about doing that. Um, We haven't actually had any further discussions on that currently. What we have done thus far is we've created an athlete and runner 
safeguarding and welfare toolkit for the national governing bodies in athletics. So our aim with that is to see the implementation of the zero tolerance policy um, kind of filter all the way down. So because we obviously believe that structural change is the best way to make an impact, but we have to make sure that it filters all the way down. Um, so we're hoping that that toolkit will be able to be translated across other sports. But essentially, it's a kind of manual to guide athletes through the reporting process um, to provide information on what are the steps of the, of the process, what constitutes abuse, who can they talk to, what is victim blaming, because unfortunately, that's also a part of it. Um, and we've actually had our first athlete experience it. Um, obviously, I let her know that it was a draft, but she said that it was really, really helpful and it helped educate her and help, help her understand what was happening to her. Um, and so alongside the national governing bodies, we're also going to be making videos to kind of complement that, that material, which is just infographics as well. So it's kind of trying to make it a, a, like a palatable and consumable product that is not daunting or or off-putting it's not just a screed of black and white text on a page which is what safeguarding sections on websites have been has been up to this point mm -hmm. so what's interesting is that you came out on instagram and said that whereas athletics as a whole wasn't uh, going to observe the social media blackout mm -hmm. in protest against the kind of abuse that people face and the trolling that people face on social media that you were planning to participate in it. Yeah. And Emily and I were texting about um, an opinion piece earlier saying that that social media blackout obviously had the best of intentions in mind, but the timing of it meant for women's rugby the fact that Emily played in a game where the floodlights inexplicably went out during an international uh, didn't enjoy the kind of, I want to say outrage, but at least coverage yeah. or attention. And, and so the, unfortunately, the unintended consequence there was the fact that women's sport suffered as a result yeah. of something that had the greatest kind of, you know, yeah. meaning. Yeah, I actually agree. And I, I remember kind of on the Monday morning, um, you know, like three or four days into the blackout. And I said to my boyfriend, like, this blackout is, I, li I love the intent and I love the, the message, but I kind of what now? Like, what is the actionable change that we're going to see as part of that? And two of our ambassadors for Kaniska are tennis players. And I appreciate as well that the black the, the blackout was kind of provoked from racial problems within football and then kind of morphed into this general message around abuse online. But our two ambassadors from tennis received death threats after their match, which is a regular occurrence for them. And this was the day after the boycott. So Yes, like I think it's great to be doing actions. I think it's great to all women's sports team together and take action and do something. But I'm not sure that that hit the right note, as you say. And I and I kind of, yeah, it's great to all campaign together, but we need to campaign not just to raise awareness, but also to do something. There needs to be action. And I think that's what Kate and I feel quite passionately about that our campaigns are not just to raise awareness and educate, it's to change things. It's to change policies to improve environment within which women are competing yeah i mean it's, di it's difficult isn't it because i was so many times through the weekend that i sort of wanted to put something out but i was like no we're not doing that and then we did show and came back and everyone called us vile for our picks in our in our fun lions pick that we did and we got abused about it and we said in the time look everyone's gonna be different don't judge us just pick your own say you don't agree that's fine because you're allowed to have an opinion but you don't mm. need to say you're all vile you, you throwing f bombs at us, throwing everything. Out. You just don't need to do that. And I think, uh, and I agree with you. I thought straight after I was like, well, what was the point in doing that? You know, no one, no one cares. No one listens. Everyone, you, we know we've, it's been a tough year on, but there's no need to take it out on, on anyone who's doing their sport for their, what they love. You know, I, mean, I, I, I agree completely in the fact they really missed its point. People will have still have. Uh, have put their abuse out there without having any recourse because no one came back at them because everyone else was off, off social media. So then it hasn't worked at all, has it? Yeah. 
I mean, how, how what's your thoughts going forward on how you, how you drive that and how uh, how you I don't know turn people's opinions into positivity rather than sitting on a, a left and a right. No one sits in the middle anymore. How do you champion sitting in the middle and appreciating everyone else's views? I think it's just education. I think it's opening a conversation. I've I've spoken again about this quite a lot with um, the different people we're working with and. Yes, we want to make change and we're we're angry and that's why we want to make the change. But I think when you're presenting your argument, you're essentially selling an ideal, right? So like my boyfriend keeps saying, you know, you're in sales, Mary. And I'm like, I'm not in sales, obviously, but I suppose to an extent you are, you know, I'm, I'm trying to convince people that women's sport is worth their time, women's sport and equality and safety and welfare is worth spending time on and so you do have to communicate that message in different ways depending on your audience and I think it's knowing who your audience is you know and you and you have to be sensitive to that and I think there's there is a place for being really rigid and unmoving on your point of view and I think that that can be powerful but I think simultaneously powerful is knowing how to structure an argument in such a way that people are able to listen and engage and inviting people to engage. You know, we, we don't want to ostracize and alienate men or anybody else from this conversation because by doing that, we're not going to see change. We need everybody to be involved in it. And I think part of what we're doing is trying to release blog entries or rather articles around it to kind of spark conversation. So we have a, an, a blog series called the female gaze which is to kind of provoke conversations around the different bits of work that we are doing and to kind of in in a in an open way say hey don't know if you've thought about this but this is interesting we're not presenting an opinion necessarily but i think let's open a conversation about it I think one of the biggest things for me is i think you touched on it is like the visibility of it so like we obviously in women's rugby we're we're in a pretty good place, but you're still continuing to, you know, jump over hurdles, batter certain doors down, whatever. And I think I'm at the stage now where I get frustrated when it's highlighted which door we've just batted down, i.e., I don't know, for example, the Six Nations final was broadcast on BBC Two, and quite a lot of the stuff you saw on social media was the first time women's rugby is shown on free to air, or the first time Six Nations final is shown on and I get it because you it, it's still good ab advertising and whatnot but do we need to say it's the first time for someone who's never seen that before just tell them it's on they don't need to know it's the first time they don't need their attention to be drawn to the fact that this isn't normal they just need to know it's happening what time it's happening and then they can make their own decision on whether to, to tune in or not and I think sometimes my frustration and I'm sure it spans lots of sports is and it's hard because you need to get the balance between celebrating the improvement um and the the progression that that you're making but also just stop telling people that this is the first time this has never been done before da, 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 da. just make it normal they won't know the the 10 year old that's i don't know if 10 a bit young but however the whatever year old that's just picked up twitter or instagram has never been on before they don't know any difference so don't tell them just let them think that this is what's normal and then obviously we're talking lots of many years to come, but that will then follow them through. And um, I think that's that's something that frustrates me and and it's a balance and I don't know how you strike it, but um, yeah. It's an, it's an interesting uh, question because I ask myself, this is someone who reports on sport, um, whether to spend more time on explaining why the match is going to be interesting, defending champs up against the team who's made it all the way up the log. No one knows exactly how, but there's a great big rivalry here between, you know, for example, the, the two star fly offs or whatever, kind of angling angling heavily towards the intrigue within the match as you would do in men's sport um, and seeing if, if that's how you draw people's attention in uh, but then I mean the news angle is that it's never been on TV before and so that is the thing that's new to this um, and I, I feel like that's something that as journalists we are still trying to kind of distinguish between when is the right moment to have that conversation but like how on this show sometimes 
we want to talk about hair and how you have your hair plait, but also talk about the rugby and, and how that's important and, you know, body positivity and, and the rest. Um, Mari, I want to get back to the running before our time with you runs out. What have you decided which distances you're going to compete in? Because I did read that at one point you were kind of all over the place and that you hold a deep, true love for the marathon. Oh, yeah. I mean, I say it's a deep, true love. I've never competed in a marathon. I, um, I, I just get very emotional every time I watch one. I just cry. I can't help it. I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, I, just think, I just think it's the like sheer dedication and the amount of effort that it takes to even get to the start line um and all of those like lonely early morning training sessions and like you know the pain that your body's going to be in when you finish I just find there's something very like human about the marathon something and it's so you have to be so vulnerable um during the race I think that's kind of beautiful um so yeah I have huge ambitions to do a marathon at the moment I'm not sure um, basically because it's early season and because I'm just getting back to racing, um, my coach and I have decided to just kind of do a couple of 5Ks at the moment. Um, and I ran a road race a month ago where I was one second off the qualifying time. And I didn't, it was completely unexpected. I genuinely had no idea. So when I ran that, I was sort of like, oh, well, maybe the 5Ks on the cards. So now um, I'm basically going to have a normal track season as I would any other year, you know, that, and that involves doing maybe a 10K or two, because for the 10K, you only have to run the qualifying time once, but for the 5K, you have to run it twice. So there are multiple 5K opportunities and I'm going to do a couple of them, see what happens, fingers crossed. And then um, hopefully by the end of the year, I'll, I'll build up towards doing a marathon kind of in autumn time um and again see what happens it's kind of just it, it, it I am wanting to qualify and I'm focusing on those times but I do have until May next year so as much as I want to put the pressure on myself to run the times I don't want to put too much pressure on myself just now especially because I'm just enjoying running again and if I put too much mm. pressure on myself I'll all of a sudden find myself hating it again <laughs> yeah and you've got to protect your body as well if you're just back in there you don't want to start flogging yourself for times and then get an injury or or whatever as you say it's all about pacing through yeah. through the year isn't it yeah exactly yeah and the season is so long you know we have to we start competing competitively in like early, late april and we finish in late august um it's a long time to be racing you know almost every week okay well that is very exciting and i can't wait to see uh, what kineska gets up to next uh, you have such amazing ambitions and it's beautiful to see uh, the work you are doing not only for other athletes um in athletics but also uh, women across the board in sport and um it's amazing to be able to to speak to you and get a a, a feel for the kind of energy you have it's been so cool thank you for your time thank you i also just want to add and i know this is a bit cheeky but it's kind of a shameless plug um if anyone is listening to this and feels kind of passionate about what we're doing if you can donate to our crowdfunder we'd be so grateful just to help us support what we're doing we are a non-profit so thank you Plug away. We enjoy that. Plug, plug away. away. <laughs> yes. Emily, anything you'd like to plug? <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't think so. I've gone, we, we've gone a bit quiet now. The semi final. Plug the semi final. Yeah. When is that on? Um, the live stream, Allianz Premier live stream, and BT Sport app. Or yes. get down to the Stonex and actually watch because crowds are back. And how exciting is that? That's amazing can't wait yeah i mean you get to play in front of actual real People. live humans and not just the bench not just yeah and not and not just bored stuck in stands or yeah. anything like that very um, we're, probably, we're probably all choke under the pressure and be terrible <laughs> <laughs> and then mike you guys uh, caught up with uh, courtney laws this week yeah um obviously you know a, a man in his opinionated in his own way um wasn't expecting to go on alliance but a very interesting bloke what he does off the field as well in terms of you know he's spoken out about the the things that we've talked about racism and obviously black, black life matters and he had his own opinion on that and obviously some other stuff um so he's worth a listen he's he's a very grounded man and someone who definitely sits in the middle um you know we talked about 
that there always seems to be polar differences and no one sort of stands on a balanced view so he's definitely one of those guys and uh, yeah he was fa- he was fascinating to chat to well get that uh, go listen to the good the bad and the rugby wherever you find your podcasts or uh, go watch the video version on youtube uh, thank you to allianz uh, for their support of the show it's so great to hear um more stories of amazing women doing powerful things blazing a trail and leaving a legacy that's it for this edition goodbye